My name is Eugene Park. I'm an assistant professor and the associate director of the BFA Communication Design uh, Program. It's my honor to welcome you here tonight for tonight's double feature. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, and on behalf of uh, our BFA and MPSCE programs are committed to the critical inquiry of type and typography and type design. Um, it's very rare that we have uh, someone like Tobias and Nina speaking tonight, so we're extra excited. Next, I'm going to um, invite our double house to the stage of the president of the team. Hi, everyone, and, and thanks for coming. Uh, we're really glad to have you here, and before I introduce uh, Tobias and Nina tonight. I just want to quickly tell you about some things that are coming up at the TDC. Um, first of all, the, the, the soonest uh, event that I should tell you about is tomorrow night. Uh, Neville Brody, the designer Neville Brody, is speaking here again tomorrow night uh, in the same place at the same time, 6 p.m. So I hope you can make it. Uh, he's, he's been quite a force in design for, for 30 plus years, uh, so it's really great that he's here and you can hear him. Um, also, you'll notice the, uh, the bouncing avenir behind me. Um, that is something that's really new for the TDC that uh, we really want to get the word out about. It's a, called Ascenders. It's a project that is meant to um, highlight and celebrate the careers of, of younger type designers and designers who use a lot of type. Or, or, uh, have a body of work that has uh, some type of typographic strength and presence to it. So um, we hope you enter the deadline for that is June 25th. Um, then the other thing I want to mention, the third thing is in July, July 18th is our big sort of uh, evening where we have opened an exhibition, we present our scholarships, and we announce uh, the Best in Show awards from our competition, our last competition. And uh, also we present the, the TDC medal to um, uh, the, the yearly annual winner, and this year it's Fiona Ross. So we really hope you can join all of us for that. There's a reception uh, for that that's always packed and fun. Uh, also I want to mention tonight, after this talk, uh, there, is a, there is more wine and uh, gathering a reception downstairs again in the event cafe. So please hang around for that if you'd like. So uh, tonight, as you know, we have Tobias Fair Jones and Nina Stosinger, and I want to just tell you a little bit about them. Uh, Tobias uh, has, uh, for 20, 25 years, has established himself as one of the world's leading typeface designers, creating some of the most widely used typefaces, including Interstate, Pointer Oil Old Style, Whitney, Gotham, Surveyor, Tungsten, and Retina. His work is in the per permanent collections of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London and the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 2006. The Royal Academy of Visual Art, The Hague, awarded him the Garrett Mordzai's Prize, and in 2013, he received the AIG Medal in recognition of exceptional achievements in the field of design. Nina Stosinger is a senior typeface designer at Freer Jones Type, and uh, she's originally from Basel in Switzerland, and received some degrees from universities we just agreed I can't pronounce, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, has a certificate in type design from Zurich University and then an MA in type and media from the Royal Academy of Art in The Hague. Mina now teaches type design at Yale University School of Art. She's on the board of the directors of the Type Directors Club. And her published type designs include Conductor with Tobias Fair Jones, Nordvest, and FF Ernestine. Thank you for not giving those German, <laughs> difficult German names. Um, so, please welcome Tobias. Oh, Nina, are you first? Okay, Nina, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
I promise I will not have a lot of unpronounceable things in this presentation. Um, and I'm going to take you on a little journey to what I call the dark side of the contrast. It's not quite as dramatic as that sounds. Um, but this goes back to um, a project I actually started as my graduation project at Tech Media and it kept kind of keeping me busy both in terms of the work on the project and also thinking about the concepts that I lay behind it. Um, so, I'm a type designer, which, if you ask me, is a great job of rolling it to do this kind of stuff all day, which um, is certainly not for everybody. I love it. It's a very, it's a very complicated kind of fitting bit of work to make, you know, sets of shapes play together well uh, and speak in a common voice. Um, I'm guessing that not everybody in the room is necessarily from a type design background, so pardon me, just do a little bit of a That's like one of the most 
pervasive rules. It's like if you look at the countries uh, across different styles and eras and, and ages, um, and you will very, very likely find that the vertical bits are heavier than horizontal bits. And even when there's not, like in the bottom right example, even when there's not supposed to be a lot of visible contrast, uh, we're taught to make the horizontals lighter because we're so used to seeing it this way that if you're making the same, we run the risk of the horizontals looking to today. Um, of course, this rule comes with a little asterisk because not all letters actually have horizontal and vertical bits. Um, most of the alphabet is more or less organized in elements that run either parallel or perpendicular to the direction we are in. Um, so that's, that's all the white ones on the left here. And then we have those odd bits that have uh, diagonals and the curly bits and the largest G that actually has the weight on, on the horizontal. And I'll get to those in a second. But the most part, and now I'm thinking I should have correlated this with other things to do that next time. Um, for the most part, text is, you know, organized and these are orthogonal um, distinctions. And then, of course, we ask why. Because if we look at other scripts, for example, Hebrew or, or Arabic, um, they do it just the other way around. They have to put the majority of the weight on the horizontals and not on the verticals. Uh, yeah, I think also pretty set in, in, in that. Um, so it's not some kind of you know, God-given or you know, high anatomy given rule that we have to have in verticals. It's just the way we've been doing it in the Latin alphabet. And in fact, that's the way we've been doing it more and more. Um, a large part of Thai history actually is uh, the development of the, these old style phases that used to have relatively low contrast. Um, and you know, the paper got better, the printing got better, the type of material got better, and printers kind of entered this race of making the, making the forms more elegant and making the hairlines thinner. And so what you get over a number of, of, of centuries is actually also a gradual erosion of, of horizontal elements. Um, mostly horizontal. You see how the G kind of pops up being the horizontal thing. Um, so is this actually a good thing? I don't know. Uh, and, and, and yes, why? I mean, the best question, uh, the best answer that I've found so far to the question about the why is that um, the way that the scribes used to, like the pens they used, and the way they, the way they held those pens, um, pre-printing, which are of course, you know, the, the, the written shapes later influenced the, the typographic shapes a lot, um, established various kinds of contrast patterns, and I'm also showing this to illustrate that both of these, uh, both of these kind of prototypical contrast models being the brown pen or the pointed pen uh, result in horizontals that are heavier than uh, verticals. And that's just kind of the way they develop and that they never change. Um, as an aside, uh, these contrast models also explain what happens when we leave the diagonals and those bits uh, that don't have you know, strictly orthogonal features. Um, the easiest way to remember is that in, in pretty much all cases, the thing that would have been the downstream if you write it is the thing that's heavy. So on A is always going to be heavy on the right side. And that's a rule that's just as uh, solid as the, the vertical uh, rule. So that leaves us with the design space in which most of the time design is really uh, the, the vast majority of the text design um, moves around in, uh, which is infinite in some directions, but certainly not all. Um, so we get certain parameters that are okay to tweak, like the amount of contrast, the amount of weight, the direction of the contrast. But this thing, this, this cube here, has an entire dark side, there's a dark side, that nobody, that, that people don't usually visit because it looks kind of weird there. And then of course the question is, is this, do people not make these shapes because they look weird? Or do they look weird because we don't see them very often? And of course, the answer is kind of both. Because um, this is the other component to, to sort of be the inherent conservatism of, of text type design is that uh, a lot of it also comes down to familiarity. And certainly, um, you know, an aspect of this 
uh, that the more we see a certain kind of typeface, the more we uh, associate it with you know, this is that kind of reading experience. And, and just this, as readers, I assume that it's, this, is, this is fine. And if we see something that looks different, you know, there's this kind of a little bit of irritation that goes. Um, on the other hand, though, this relative scarcity of typefaces that kind of leverage that side of the design space uh, also means that there's, it hasn't been done to death yet, which is that type design, let's be honest. I mean, there's a lot of catastrophes that have been raised to death. Um, and as David Jonathan Ross says, who's a, a, a great um, designer who does a lot of and reverse contrast type, and also lectures on, on the subject, um, this, this opens up a lot of exciting design space uh, that may make sense to explore. So what if, what, what if we go to a world where Latin, you know, describes and help their pen some other way and all are a little bit different? And it's certainly worth um, a little thought experiment. And of course there is historical precedent of this kind of thing. There are people who have tried to make type of heavier horizontals. And the story of that kind of started, starts in, in this kind of world. I'll do the, uh, the resolution. I was very happy with this image at all. Uh, it is actually slightly too late, but it's approximately the right time, early 19th century in, in England. Um, so we're in like, the, the early stages of the, of the Industrial Revolution. Like, posters start being a thing. Newspapers start seeing much, much greater print runs. And so type founders and type setters um, suddenly see themselves much more in the situation that they need type that not only tells stories, but they need type that yells at people, they need type that captures eyeballs, and type that's loud, type that's bold, type that's beat, and type that's most importantly louder and bigger and more eye-catching than, than the other guys type. Right? So type founders kind of go into this crazy period of experimentation trying to come up with new type forms, to the point that within just a handful of years, was in a situation where the dominant shapes, letter shapes looked like this, when you're a high contrast, thin hair line sort of type. Within just a few years, uh, time founders come out with the first slab serif typeface, the first sand serif typeface, and then of course somebody thought of just putting the contrast on its head. So that that last would be the first reverse contrast type design is uh, Henry Castellan's Italian uh, senior on the bottom. The top is uh, Howard's Zeal of 1828, uh, which I put there so for comparison, both because I was very happy to find you know, two specimens that sort of both say versatile, but also because it kind of illustrates, um, sorry, the joints of the leather, um, that, that illustrate how this works, because this is literally reverse contrast. So everything that's supposed to be thin is made thick. Every, everything that's supposed to be thick is made thin, and that's really it. Um, it's, I mean, I don't think anybody thought this actually looks as good. It's more of a, a thought experiment, I guess. Um, so that's the entire logic of it. You, you look at how letters are going to be supposed to be made, and then they flip it. Um, I always think they look a bit inside out. Because even the stairs, like the papers are a little like, This is a guy who makes like, you know, turns teddy bears inside out and then stuff. Um, which I don't know, in my head, it's kind of the same thing. Um, the other thing that these letter shapes do is that they, um, they remap sort of the, the hierarchy of, of the shape and uh, the importance of, of elements within the shape, right? Because you have like structural or contextual elements, like stems, suddenly becoming very thin and spindly. On the other hand, like these little appendages that we think of as just kernels um, are suddenly like weight bearing and, and big and dominant. So you're kind of reading uh, the shape differently. So this is definitely all the way around this layout of this record. This isn't even trying to be palatable, that's actually actively trying to be the opposite. Um, it's also not trying to be, to be pretty, it's, it's kind of reveling in its, in its offensiveness, if you will. And it was also frequently uh, 
receiving as such. Nevertheless, these things stayed around for a while, remaining some various more or less completely useless variants. I've actually seen Italians in use maybe two or three times. It seems like they were not. It was probably more of a bit of a statement than actually something that was useful. And they have to be corrected if I'm wrong in that. Um, but this was not the only uh, way that people found figured out to put a bit more weight on the horizontals and the verticals. Um, there are these two kind of basic types on the left, the Italian, which we were just talking about, where, um, and this is where we get back to the, the diagonals. So this is literally flipped contrast logic. So also the light diagonal becomes dark or heavy, the heavy diagonal becomes light. Uh, which makes these letters look very weird too. And the French model is basically a, a standard low contrast design that just has to be added to the top and bottom. Um, but when these are Italian and French to the degree that salad dressings are Italian and French, they're not from like this is all English stuff. And so this is this is all almost everything I'm showing is like from the Anglo-American typographic tradition. Um, these are kind of letters just um, Convention of giving designs names from like more or less remote exotic places, uh, especially in the year. Um, these are also sometimes referred to as Egyptians, which can also be slab sayers, which can also be sand sayers. Uh, I've also seen these referred to as Belgians in certain proportions, and it doesn't really, it, it, it's not very like organized. Um, but so the French things are kind of like, this is how, this is how it works. So you take like a low contrast slab stair, Clarendon sort of design, and then you add weight to the top of the bottom. And this is most often referred to as a French achievement or a French Clarendon. And so this is less of an inside out teddy bear and more, more like just a guy wearing a fist. And of course, it's much more fun. And this is, of course, is that uh, we know from, from Western movies and carnivals and circuses. And this one actually got really popular. This is slightly later in the 19th century. I think it started in the like, 1860s. And I believe in Europe was kind of a little bit of a fad, but in America, it really, really caught on. Um, and was produced, this is now from an American family, uh, produced in a uh, whole number of sizes and sometimes you get these uh, softened brackets, which makes them from, from the counter shapes. And you can also wrap the outside. Founders have a lot of fun with these. And, but it also, it didn't necessarily stay um, a pigeonhole in this, in this kind of circus, part of the western circuit corner. Um, and especially um, approaching the turn of the century, around 1900, you get a lot of It's kind of leveraging that formal impact 
for more kind of standing out. Um, and oh, here's a That's not good enough. Even uh, today, there's uh, like have a little look about about uh, like contemporary uh, digital homes that are using kind of aesthetic. And much of it is at the same thing. Like much of it is, is very experimental, very loud, very extreme to the point of almost not being readable. Um, almost not being read, even. Um, playing with this, with uh, you know both the sort of historical associations we have and the kind of the way these shapes break against an idea of what quote unquote contemporary is. And there's so much fun. I mean, there's so many good fun designs um, that uh, that are very loud and they're very fun and on the other uh, end of the spectrum, you suddenly find a few things that actually are surprisingly quiet. One of the earliest ones of these is Antigone by J. Swan that just has like a very, very subtle stress on the top of the X hat. And I read about this design and, and I was just completely stopped in my tracks when I found this quote. Because this runs entirely counter to, to everything I just said in the last 10 minutes or so. Um, because apparently he has the idea that, that putting the weight on the horizontal actually has a functional reason or a functional effect for reading. And I'm just like, this is crazy. I don't know. I don't know how that works. So the, the point he's making is placing the weight on, in the direction of reading, parallel to the direction of reading meaning on horizontals, um, stresses the important parts of the word and also binds words together. Um, and I was thinking about this and I realized that I don't really have a clear idea of what verticals versus horizontals do uh, for the texture of text. Um, so here's a little, here's a little experiment to, um, to play with that. Um, this is this is not a design project. This is just kind of a little research experiment. Um, this is by Ivan Brisman, um, which uh, is a nice practice. It's from Adobe. It also has a license that uh, allows me to take it apart, which I've now proceeded to do. Um, for the purpose for the for the purposes of this experiment, I focused on the letters that uh, you know make this point most clearly in terms of having features that are running either parallel or perpendicular to the direction of the line. Um, that means I left out the dynamics of the gene um, just to kind of see a more concentrated version of this effect. Um, and I made two derivative fonts, one of which contained only uh, verticals, seen here in red. Oh, saturation is crazy. You're getting a full color experience. Um, the other one uh, containing just the horizontals, which is which are green bits of music. And so here's the text. And I'm gonna flip back and forth a few times between the version that just has the verticals and then the version that just has the horizontals. <laughs> Anybody wager your guess which one you are for me? Who's for the verticals? How many people's for the horizontals? Who's for like everything? <laughs> okay. Um, so there's a couple of things that I think are really worth um, pointing out about this situation. Um, we are, of course, more and more used to seeing this kind of pattern in a text. I mean, this is somewhat similar to this very, very high contrast. Uh, type um, that, that I was showing earlier. So this is kind of more something that looks like something we've seen before, whereas this is just completely weird. Um, a point that I would totally give to Mr. X performance is that this, this totally binds words together. I mean, it certainly binds lines together, right? You get these runaway tracks just, just running across um, that make it very clear sort of where the tops and bottoms of the line are. Um, the other thing that I think is also interesting is that that, that second line here, the only verticals, 
does a great job of establishing the human rhythm, but it does not do such a great job of telling you what the levels actually are, right? Especially if you have more like a minimum. Um, it takes a bit of puzzling there to figure out where one letter ends and the other ends. Um, and that is uh, where I would give the other point to Mr. X. Paul, that uh, the, the, the horizontals version actually, uh, the, what the horizontals do here is they do a pretty good job of establishing the identities of the individual letters. Um, there's also a couple of problems which um, are probably relevant for designing this kind of thing, um, which is if you look at the A and E, um, the, the number of horizontals per letter is, is not fixed, obviously, like the E has three and the I has kind of none. Um, so you're going to, if you just stress all the results, you're going to end up with some letters that are faster than others. In the other direction, that's not an issue. You have know, like an N and an M. One has two verticals, the other has three, but because that's the direction in which the script runs, then we don't have to you know, design letters to even with, so we can just write them out, which doesn't work so well the other way. Um, as a side note to the side note, I was curious how this would play out if we take the stairs and we And unfortunately, there's also a source sound, so I got to take that apart too. Um, and here's so this is Sarah on the left and the sound is on the right. And there's terrible idea. And one thing that becomes very apparent in this is that Sarah kind of uses rely much more strongly on the one of the ones where I even live in. Um, of, of the verticals, <laughs> and, and then this becomes some kind of concrete poetry sort of thing. Um, so uh, this does not seem very helpful in, in the sounds of the design space, and because we're not getting that linking of the lines so much, because you know the stairs that would constitute the railway tracks are not there. Um, on the other hand, we have features and in fact entire letters get lost. Um, I mean, if you look at that as cat, H-I-T, um, the I is just completely gone in the version that doesn't have verticals, obviously. But it's also completely unreadable in the version that doesn't have, that only has verticals. And I think this may um, explain to some degree why sans errors generally usually have fairly low contrast in these Um, 
because it might actually look kind of cool, like you're just doing things completely wrong. And it also just yielded some interesting information about proportions and about features and about how the, the curves, the inner and the outer curves, could relate to each other. And, um, and I started sketching. And this was a lot of fun. I realized after a while I was really sketching this later thing. Um, and all of the stuff that's very expressive. I started sketching it uh, italic as well. And sort of got all of that more expressive stuff out of my system, I guess. Um, and then came the months, you know, represented as seconds of just, you know, gradual refining and toning it down and making it into something that would work. Um, one of the main processes uh, was something I came to refer to as a purification because in the beginning I was all like, I'm going to make this thing and it's expressive and it's different, right? And then uh, we had Chief Christian Schwartz came in for a guest lecture. He looked at it and he was like, do you want this to live in a children's book or do you not? I was like, no, not really. And he essentially told me to make it more boring. And so that was, that was really most of the process was to get the flavor out and to make it as boring as possible while maintaining this, you know, the contrast level. Um, a lot of this was, was quite difficult. Also, like, the thing, like, how do you manage the situation where you have a thin stem and then a heavy zero and not make it look like something that came from a surface. Um, the answer to some degree and softening the transition from the stem to the sear, just making it feel more like a pure shape rather than you know something that's like the platform shoes. Um, and also I continuously make food and boost the contact more and more and more, which turned out to be really important for making it uh, you know solid. And a lot, of, a lot of the time really was spent thinking about what, how should, like what are the rules of this design? Because of course, because I, I started out by rejecting a central rule, um, it was a little bit more difficult to kind of make up what rules would come in its place, like how, how to do the diagonals actually work, how does the way you get stuck on. And so the rule I made up in the end is that um, I would draw a sort of normal, Conventional, conventional low contrast uh, shapes and just inflate the top and the bottom uh, horizontals. Um, and especially fun was kind of trying to figure out what, what I could do with the letter structures that would help the horizontals. Um, credit to James Edmondson for coming up with this weird ampersand shape. I love it. And he didn't draw it, but he, like, he was like, you should put a thing on this. Um, and this was also interesting. I mean, it's not unheard of in entire designs, even in like conventional contrast side designs, if you have a large weight range that you have to raise the X height on the mobile end um, to, to just accommodate the more stuff that is there. Uh, in this case, I had to raise the X height and the extenders and the caps um, just because if you, there's, there was physically no room, there was physically no room to put like even those even the half sears, like about the X height. And, and I was talking about this with Kristen Sarkis, who makes um, Arabic type. And he said this is, this is kind of a classic thing to happen in Arabic type, is that when you make a bowl, you have to completely re reckon the vertical space, because that's literally where the wing goes. That's, that's the direction in which they grow. So that to me was really interesting. I kind of started from a different premise for this design, changed some of the processes, and also changed some of the, the questions that came up. Um, so this is the thing I ended up with. Um, one of the main challenges that I made myself was that I kind of wanted to avoid this, this mechanical, and I can't stop thinking about phases of platform shoes, but like, I didn't want it to look like a designer just had like, some amount of black stuck to his head and feet. Um, so a lot of it was like thinking about how to make the shapes look more organic, uh, to kind of bake that contrast into them so that it would look like an inherent part of the design and not something like that's just stuck on. Um, so there's a lot of trickery in here. There's one of the things like there's that diagonal versus an apexes that are slightly like pulled apart so I can put more weight in there. Um, and then the Italian, there's the 
Google Maps for the stroking of loops around, which of course is a not kind of a cursive letter form, but it also wants you to set tricks to put more weight into that program, like the bottom left of the end, and how well somebody's got to put weight there in a cursive design. Um, Is kind of easy because it's just like you're rejecting something. I mean, the hard part is 
what are you building in its stead? Um, so, so that was what, kind of what I took away and what I uh, try to do is question the rules and conventions we work with, try to figure out why they're there, try to figure out what happens if we break them. Try bending them, try breaking them very gently, observe very exactly what happens, and think well about what to put in their stead, and then see if it can be made to work. And then maybe we can expand that little band of possibility in which the discoveries are made more and more 